Friends, we all know how important calculus is for our mathematics. You will find its applications not only in mathematics but also in many other subjects and the main credit for its discovery is given to Newton and Leibniz. There was quite a healthy debate between Newton and Leibniz over the discovery of calculus, about who is the true inventor of calculus. But I have a question for you. Do you think that only Newton and Leibniz created calculus? Actually the answer is absolutely not because the discovery of calculus isn't something that could happen in a single day. It was a long process that involved around 9 to 10 game-changing discoveries. From ancient Greece to the 20th century, calculus has continuously evolved and without these discoveries, we wouldn't have calculus, nor quantum mechanics, nor differential geometry, nor any of the discoveries that depend on calculus. So today, let's take an overview of all these discoveries. Who invented calculus? So first, let me take you to ancient Greece in 200 BC, where there was a genius mathematician named Archimedes. He was the first to plant the seed of the tree we now call calculus. Actually, at that time, Archimedes was trying to calculate the areas and volumes of different shapes and the method he used for these calculations was called the infinite simul, or the method of exhaustion. Now, what is the method of exhaustion? Suppose you want to calculate the area of a circle. Archimedes said that you should draw polygons inside and outside the circle. For example, triangles, squares, pentagons, hexagons and so on, just keep increasing the number of sides. The greater the number of sides the polygon has, the closer that polygon will get to the circle. So, the more you increase the number of sides, the closer your polygon gets to the circle and the difference between the area of the polygon and the circle becomes smaller. In this way, we get very close to the value of pi. And Archimedes was the first to calculate the value of pi in this way, which, for that time, was an astonishingly accurate value of pi. But this method was not perfect. Well, it was a bit slow, and generalizing it for complex shapes like cones or irregular curves was quite difficult. But even so, this was the first step towards calculus. The concept of infinitesimals, where infinitely small things were used to solve big problems. And well, using this very concept, Archimedes showed that it is possible to understand infinity. Well, I've already made a detailed video on this concept, so you can check it out from the link given in the description box. Now let me take you towards the second discovery. For this, we need to go back to the 17th century Italian Renaissance period, where Bonaventura Cavalieri introduced the world to a new idea called the method of indivisibles. Well, let me explain it like this. Suppose you take any shape, whether it is 2D or 3D. So Cavalieri said, any shape, whether 2D or 3D or... It is made up of infinitely thin slices and we call these slices individuals. Think of it this way. Suppose you take a cylinder and divide that cylinder into infinite circular discs. Now what will be the area of each disc? Pi r squared and when you multiply this by the height, you get the volume of the entire cylinder. Well, this idea seems similar to Archimedes' method, but it's a step further because it allows you to find the area and volume of even complex shapes. For example, if you want to find the volume of a cone, you can also divide it into thin slices. Calculate the area of each slice and sum them up, and this was the method described in his book called Geometria Individuals. But even this method had a limitation. Actually, this method was geometrical and not algebraic, so it only worked for specific shapes. But still, it gave us a new way of thinking about calculus, that we can break a shape into infinitely small pieces and sum them up. And this was the first form of integration. So now, let me take you towards the third discovery. For this, you have to go to Europe, where two mathematicians, René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat, gave geometry a new dimension, which was called coordinate geometry, or what we also call analytical geometry. In fact, they linked geometry and algebra together, Earlier, geometry was described only in terms of diagrams and shapes, but Descartes and Fermat said that every point can be described in the form of x, y, and z coordinates. So what happened because of this? Every shape, such as a circle, a line, or any curve, now you can represent them in the form of equations. For example, you can write a circle in the form of an equation, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You can describe a line in the form of an equation as y equals mx plus c, meaning that it converted a geometrical problem into an algebraic form. Before Descartes and Fermat, geometry existed only in our real world, which we measured using a compass and ruler. But with the help of coordinate geometry, they described it in the form of equations. And if you look at it, this is one of the best breakthroughs in mathematics. 
Descartes presented this idea in his book La Géométrie, and Fermat independently developed a similar idea. And this was a revolutionary shift because it set the algebraic foundation for calculus. Now we could study curves through equations, which was essential for future discoveries. Now that curves could be represented by equations, Fermat took another major step. He introduced the fourth discovery, tangent and optimization. First, let's understand the tangent. A tangent is a straight line that touches a curve at a single point without crossing it. Its slope tells us how the curve is behaving at that point, how steep or how flat it is. Fermat provided a method by which you can find the tangent to any curve, and this was the first form of the derivative. Because the derivative tells us what the slope of a function is at a given point. For example, if the equation of the curve is equal to x squared, then its slope at any point is simply 2x. So, the line that touches any curve at a single point, that is, the tangent, shows the behavior of the curve at that point. Now what is optimization? It is about finding the maximum and minimum values, like if you want the highest or lowest point on a curve. For example, how high a ball can go, or how to maximize a company's profit. So Fermat showed that where the slope of the tangent is zero, that point on the curve is either a maximum or a minimum. And this idea is now at the core of modern calculus. Whether it's engineering, economics or physics, the idea of finding maximum and minimum is used everywhere. And in class 12, you might have studied this chapter separately in calculus. Well, this is what made calculus practical, and this idea belonged to Fermat. Now comes discovery 5, and this is the main point that was the turning point for calculus. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, which is credited to Isaac Newton and Leibniz. This theorem states, in fact, it connects the two concepts of differentiation and integration with each other. What is differentiation? It tells us how much a function is changing at a particular point, that is what its slope or rate of change is. For example, if your car's speed is changing with time, you can use differentiation to find the acceleration. What is integration? It sums up infinitely small pieces, like the area under a curve or the volume of a 3D shape. For example, if you want to find the area under the curve of a regular shape, you use integration. So the fundamental theorem of calculus states that differentiation and integration are inverses of each other. This means that if you take the derivative of a function and then integrate it, you get back the original function, and this was a eureka moment. Newton explained this through fluxions while Leibniz used infinitesimals. But the problem with this was that their method was not mathematically rigorous. The concept of infinitesimals was intuitive, but it also had paradoxes. Even so, this theorem gave calculus a solid framework, and this was the official birth of calculus. And without Newton and Leibniz, it would be very difficult to imagine modern calculus, but since their method also had problems. So now, let me take you to the 19th century, where Cauchy and Karl Weierstrass made calculus more scientific with the help of limits and continuity. The problem with Newton and Leibniz's infinitesimals was that they were intuitive but not mathematically solid. This led to paradoxes and ambiguities. But limits solved this problem. Limits mean understanding how a function behaves near a certain point or at infinity. For example, if you want to calculate the value of a function f(x) near a certain point. Suppose at x equals 0, the function is undefined. So what do you do using limits? Instead of going exactly to x equals 0, you approach it as closely as possible, so close that if you take one more step, it would become 0. This is the core concept of limits. So, Cauchy used limits to rigorously define derivatives and integrals. Now what is continuity? A function is continuous when there is no break or jump in it. Cauchy and Weierstrass explained continuity and differentiability through limits. This gave calculus a solid mathematical foundation. But now, a new challenge arose with calculus. Functions that behave in very strange ways. For example, functions that are continuous everywhere but differentiable nowhere. Like the Weierstrass function. To address this, we encountered discovery number 7, which is real analysis. So in essence, real analysis is a framework that deeply studies continuity, differentiability, and integrability. It helped mathematicians understand the behavior of complex numbers. For example, through real analysis, we can understand where a function is smooth, where it is oscillatory, or where it is integrable. This field made calculus more precise and versatile. Now we could handle not just simple curves, but also very complex and abstract functions. But now, let me take you to discovery number 8. 
Now we are entering an exciting field. What is complex analysis? It takes calculus from real numbers to complex numbers. Cauchy developed the theory of complex functions and formulated the Cauchy Integral Theorem, which states that under certain conditions, the integral of a complex function is zero. And after that came Riemann, who introduced the Riemann surface. This is, in a way, three-dimensional geometry for complex functions, which helps in understanding multi-valued functions. Riemann's mapping theorem showed how complex functions can be mapped. Without complex analysis, many concepts in modern physics like quantum mechanics and engineering are incomplete. Now we come to the 20th century, where Henri Lebesgue introduced Lebesgue integration. The problem with the earlier Riemann integration was that it struggled with highly irregular or infinitely oscillating functions. But Lebesgue provided a solution. Instead of partitioning the x-axis, he partitioned the y-axis. This led to a new concept called Lebesgue measure, which measures the size of complex sets. For example, if a function oscillates very wildly, the Riemann integral will fail, but the Lebesgue integral can handle it easily. This discovery was revolutionary because it broadened calculus and is used in Lebesgue integrals, functional analysis, probability theory, and quantum mechanics. And this was the final evolutionary step of calculus. So guys, this was the complete story of calculus, how calculus evolved over time. It wasn't the result of a single step, but rather the combined efforts of many mathematicians, and today, we use it in our day-to-day -day lives. So guys, that's all for today's video. I hope you really enjoyed this video. If that's the case, then please like this video, share it with your friends, and if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos or updates.